So um, today I'm going to talk about the state of managing devices, um, or at least Apple devices, because um, who wants to hear me talk about the state of managing uh, Windows devices? No one? OK. Um, so what is the state? Um, that, you know, when I, when I sat down to write this presentation, it was kind of challenging, because I started thinking, you know, what is, uh, What's really going on in the Apple community? Um, where are we at? And the answer is really that everything's changing. Um, it's been changing for quite a while. And it's changing in some good ways, some bad ways. Um, because I have a lot of friends at Apple that might yell at me, I probably won't talk about the bad ways. Um, but I'm, I might mention them a little bit. Mostly, I'll be talking about the good ways, hopefully. And the best way, I think, is managing Apple devices has, in my opinion, never been simpler than it is today in mass at least. Um, we have more tools, we have more features. Um, actually, we have more tools and less features, but that's aside from the point. Um, and those less features, or less features means that managing Apple devices is becoming a lot simpler. Um, <clears throat> so what are we gonna do today? Today, um, I'm gonna lay out a thesis. It's a pretty simple thing. I happen to think that most people walk away from a presentation especially when you're going to see 12 or however many in two days, and they remember about one thing. Uh, so out of everything you'll hear, you might remember one thing from each presentation. I'm pretty forgettable, so you might not remember anything from this one, but I will try. Um, and then you're going to help me. So um, I am working on a new book right now, or three, for the 10-11 uh, release. And while I... While I've been working on it, I've been noticing that um, the first edition of the Integrating OS X in the Enterprise book was, um, it, it laid out like, you know, how we do these things. And as I've been sitting down to write the second edition of that book, um, I'm finding that most of the book has to get new compaved because everything has changed. Um, and I'll, I'll go into more detail about how things have changed later in the presentation, but, um, but I would love especially at the end of the presentation, um, to hear kind of maybe how some people are, are using some of these things from Apple, how some people are doing things. Um, and I just realized I'm one slide behind. Um, so right around 2010, I gave a presentation at Macworld called Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and you were there? Who else was there by any chance? Just him. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't remember what happened after that presentation because I think I went out with Duncan, but that's aside from the point. Um, and in that presentation, I laid out a thesis um, that Apple's going to innovate. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to push us. They're going to change things. They're going to continue to push the envelope, make things better. And I, I said something along the lines of, they don't ask for permission. And that, that slide actually got... Um, got tweeted a whole lot because there was a picture of a dog pooping on an apple. And I said something along the lines of, I'm not insulting Apple. I'm just saying this is kind of how they do things and where they're going. Um, but I said that they won't ask for permission. But then I started thinking about it. And over the last uh, few years, it's, it's occurred to me that Apple really kind of does ask for permission. So the iPhone, um, <clears throat> when they started to change that industry, um, they released what I consider to be a minimum viable product, which the iPhone 1 didn't have a lot of features, it didn't do a lot of stuff, um, but Apple released it, they saw how the market handled it, and when they saw that, um, that there was a nice market for it, they went ahead and started building a whole lot of other features and dumping a lot of development. And that turned out to be a very good business move on their part. Um, I've also stopped asking questions about why Apple does certain things because I don't have as much money in the bank as they do, and so I figure that they're probably smarter business people than I am. Um, but you know, they, they do things, and they lay out, like, this is how we want you to use these products. And there comes a good question of, well, how do we actually use this stuff? So Apple builds something, and they ship it, and maybe we use it, maybe we don't. But, um, but 
you know, they have a general idea of what they want us to be doing as administrators. Um, so how are things changing? So the XSERV, who all had an XSERV? And who's gotten, who's still got XSERVs in production? A few people. Um, so the XSERV, it was released in 2002 and it died a miserable death um, and there were uh, petitions to keep it going. Um, we as a community did not necessarily embrace this move. Um, just out of curiosity, who in the room thinks that that was a terrible move? Who in the room has as much money as Apple in the bank? Um, so the Mac Mini, 2005 to current. The XServe Raid, who had one of these? Um, 2003 to 2008. Um, I would argue that this is not, um, so I'm gonna make a point at the end of this in case you're curious. I'm not just asking stupid random questions. I do that a lot, but I'm not doing that right now. Um, so the XServe Raid is not part of my thesis. And the reason is because in 2008, the XServe Raid needed a whole new rewrite of the back-end system, and Apple made a business decision based on the number of devices that they sold versus how much it was gonna cost them to basically reinvent the raid. They chose not to proceed. Um, so I have a thesis that I'm getting to, but this is not included in that. Um, and Apple replaced that with third-party technology, i.e. Promise. And there were splinters and fragmented markets. Um, some other storage vendors came up, but really Apple wanted people to use X, um, Promise arrays with XAN. So, um, some of the other products that Apple killed off um, in miserable, miserable deaths, some of which had like uh, Austin Powers moments where they're like, no, I'm not dead yet. But, um, but some of these things led to fragmented markets. And some of those fra fragmented markets, uh, Final Cut Server, who used that? Just out of curiosity, since we're in Australia, who used Artbox? So I had decided to uh, give away some t-shirts um, for the questions where only one person raised their hand. So um, <laughs> I had to give one to him. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so when Final Cut Server disappeared, there was no clear cut um, replacement. So I, that's one of those markets where there's like maybe 10, 15 vendors vying for that, that space. Um, podcast producer. Oh wait, I didn't cover the date. So Final Cut Server died its miserable death in 2011. Podcast producer, who used that? Still using it, wow. <laughs> I'm gonna, okay, I'm out of t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so Podcast Producer died its miserable death in 2012. Um, that was actually one of my favorite Apple technologies to integrate. It was terribly complicated, no one else understood it, and I looked like a hero when I could actually make it work. And we all, um, being in technology, pretty much love looking like heroes, so. Um, QuickTime Streaming Server, one of Apple's first server technologies, um, also died a miserable death in 2012. Does anyone see a trend with the years that these things are dying? Just out of curiosity. Um, XGrid. XGrid stayed around a little longer than Podcast Producer because it was involved in a lot of different um, other technologies that Apple was making. But uh, it died a miserable death in 2012. Server admin. Um, does anyone still have old enough versions of OS X server to run server admin? I'm out of t-shirts. Um, and I didn't have five anyways, so. Um, I'm not gonna ask why you're still running server admin. You're using Podcast Producer. Yeah, um, and that's campus workflow, like recording, yeah, re recording sessions like this, automatically producing them, and generating EPUBs, fancy. <laughs> um, you don't run that site on Podcast Producer, do you? I'm sorry? Do you run that website on Podcast Producer? No. Okay. Um, I know that's someone in Australia, but. Um, so server admin got replaced by the server app. Who loves the server app? Ah, okay. At least one person raised their hand. I am out of shirts, though. Um, so, uh, so once again, Apple asks for permission. Um, how did they ask for permission? I would argue that in this case, they released the system preference pane for server. Did anyone ever use that thing? That was a dodgy, I believe, is the word that you guys would use, piece of crap. But, um, but who still uses Workgroup Manager? 
Now, I, ha I have a question. Um, who uses Workgroup Manager uh, to augment Active Directory attributes? And then Open Directory attributes? Um, this is market research, by the way. This is what it looks like. I'm completely using you guys. No offense. Um, so, you know, the server app was a simpler design. It was easier to use. It was easier to integrate. Um, you can set up a server now in two, three minutes, as opposed to uh, uh, assuming you have enough bandwidth to download a sub 200 meg uh, app. Um, and it doesn't take nearly as long um, unless you're doing it in mass. So what we lost in the server app um, is the ability to integrate OS X um, at scale. So we saw, saw a lot of expansion up until 2010. Um, so if you notice the dates that these services were introduced, all the way up till 2010, we saw more and more stuff being added in OS X server. So what happened in 2010? Um, anyone want to take a stab? So Oracle buys Sun. Um, so, you know, at the time that Oracle bought Sun, which cost them, what, $5 billion in cash, um, Apple had, I remember distinctly at that moment in time, Apple had $64 billion in cash in the bank. And I remember talking to some people at Apple about, aren't you guys buying Sun? Um, why are you going to let someone else step in? Um, wouldn't that round off all of your technology offerings? Wouldn't it make you the you know, one of the biggest IT companies in the world. And I, I think that a lot of people at Apple were doing big gut checks at the time. Like, is this the industry we want to be in? Do we want to maintain 40 years, 30 years of IT dogma that, that we don't believe in? Locking down computers, super tight, um, terrible user experiences. Um, has anyone started uh, at a new job and sat down to change their desktop background and been denied access by a policy? And, and do you automatically love the place more? Or do you automatically hate where you're at? Um, you know, uh, Apple chose, um, they, they had this gut check, um, and they chose not to keep building more and more crappy, um, locking down type of technologies. And um, that choice was obvious by the fact that they released the, the iPad that year. Um, a move I did not understand, um, but I still don't have as much money in the bank as them, so, um, so obviously I was, I was not appropriate to be questioning that. Um, so that started um, a culling of services. It started simplifying the operating system, simplifying the interface for servers, and that leads us to pretty much where we are today, um, which is we have less tools than before, but um, a lot more people can do a lot more with them. So they also started um, a trend of simplifying the operating system. Um, so I asked about who used, uh, who used Workgroup Manager to do certain things. Who uses Open Directory as their only directory service? Two people. And um, meekly raising their hands, I might add. Um, are there any plans to, just out of curiosity, for the two people, are there any plans to move away from it? Or are you just iffy? You would move away from it, but it's too big of a pain? Ah. Um, so, so again, the technology expert is being overridden by the manager who's probably been away from technology for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, the Xserve going away was an early warning sign that maybe this whole open directory thing was something that we should start moving away from. Um, and Apple's investment into that technology, if you look at the versions of, uh, of SlapD that they're running and things of that nature, um, it, it's pretty obvious what they want us to use Open Directory for. They want us to use Open Directory to enable other services that, by the way, now fire it up automatically on our behalf. So, um, and it runs alongside whatever directory service we're really using because if Oracle wanted to build um, enterprise-grade LDAP servers, they would have bought Sun, but they didn't. Um, <clears throat> so we have a simpler design, and a lot of our tools have gotten simpler. So um, managed preferences, who uses or has used, loves managed preferences? So uh, there, there were like four questions there, right? Um, <laughs> um, so, so managed preferences was the way that we did things. Um, a lot of people still use them, as obvious, or uh, as is obvious by some of the people who raised their hands. Um, and that's been replaced by profiles. 
Um, you know, the, the way that we run profiles um, is much better in a lot of ways, especially if you're using MDM. Um, who remembers the first time that they told the doc in a MDM tool to move over to the right side and it moved over immediately rather than waiting for the next log off log on? That was rad. I, I you know, I'm not going to tell you how I felt on the inside when that happened, but I was pretty stoked. Um, so server has profile manager. So out of curiosity, again, who uses profile manager in, in at scale? Who's a, how many users? Got it. So 200 is about where it tops off. So at 250, you're probably starting to run into some issues, I'm going to guess. Um, who used Profile Manager and then, and then did a major OS release, got screwed, and decided never to use it again? So the number of people in that scenario uh, outweighs the number of people currently using it. Um, so at scale, third parties come up. And I, I think that's, that's a core aspect of being a Mac admin today that is extremely different than it was in 2010. In 2010, a lot of people used all Apple tools, like your manager. Today, a lot of people use third-party tools. So the number of people using third-party tools for all this stuff is pretty much everybody. Um, or almost. Um, so clearly, I should have brought a lot more shirts, right? <laughs> um, so Apple, Apple built Profile Manager. They built some pretty simple technologies for us. They built Caching Server. Who uses Caching Server? A lot less people than I would have thought. Although some of those people have their eyes down on their laptops and aren't paying attention. And that's fine. You have a day job. I get it. Um, I do too. I'm going to go do that for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, so what do we see this trend of tools that Apple's introduced since 2010? Because it's pretty much just those. Um, we see that they're building tools to support iOS and OS X deployments. So no longer building tools that are specifically geared for large-scale integrations, et cetera. Um, now it's all about iOS and OS X. <clears throat> so who's used Force Touch on a MacBook? It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> No, sorry. Um, so so Apple, Apple's building some of these technologies that, that they introduced for the watch or for iOS into now OS, OS 10, right? And now we're seeing multitasking coming to iOS devices. So iOS devices are becoming a little more computer-like. So OS 10 is becoming simpler. iOS is becoming more complex in a way. <clears throat> so back to profiles. So profiles manage both iOS and OS X devices. And a profile is pretty simple. It looks like this. Um, what else looks like that? <laughs> P-lists. Yeah, manage prefs. You, you zoom in on that. See how I zoomed, by the way? One screenshot to rule them all. Um, so you zoom in, and it's, it's pretty much just a, a manifest. <clears throat> Um, and the command line is very easy. Who, who used uh, Discal with MCX read and, and writing attributes that way? And who had an awesome experience with that? Um, who's used the profiles command? And experience is better? Nodding. No one's shaking their head no. No one would like to go back to the days of using Discal? All right. So profiles are similar to managed preferences managing them with plists, or at least managing plists with defaults. Um, Apple push notifications. Um, just out of curiosity, who has those ports blocked or has had to go through getting those ports unblocked with their network teams and things like that? Um, it wasn't that bad. It was easier than, uh, than dealing with trying to get IP helpers for Netboot, right? <laughs> um, so Apple IDs. Who is uh, actually using Apple IDs with their end users? Um, and, and that's for VPP, right? Who's using Apple IDs with logon accounts for OS X? You are brave. That is, that is scary. Um, who thinks they're probably going to end up having to do that in the future? 
Maybe, maybe not. I, I think anytime you can, you uh, conjecture, anytime you try to to read the tea leaves and say what the future is, you're kind of kidding yourself that you're going to actually do the right thing. And anything that I actually know the answer to for the future, I can't say anyways, unless it's uh, been in one of Apple's WWDC sessions that's on the internet. So um, we still authenticate to new accounts in OS X um, with Apple IDs. Um, you know, no one's really using this, as, as we, we saw. Um, who's actually defined those in OS X server attributes, just out of curiosity? Who knew that that was part of an OS X server attribute that you could define? Um, so mobile device management. Mobile device management starts with these profiles that I kind of talked about, but then it goes a step further. You can wipe a device, um, you can lock a device, uh, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, VPP. Who's using VPP with the Mac App Store? And uh, who's redistributing uh, Mac App Store packages with something like Casper or FileWave? Or, um, just out of curiosity, show of hands, who would rather do it with uh, MDM? And who would rather do it with, uh, with redistribution? It depends. Just out of curiosity, what does it depend on? Is it a one, one device or is it a shared device? Is it... So is it your labs or is it yeah, yeah, yeah. devices that, that everybody has? Um, so we already mentioned that, um, that MDM comes with profiles. Um, so it's really just managing these profiles in the back end. If you, if you look at um, profiles, you can see what's coming down. Apple's very transparent, or at least tries to be. Um, that's one thing that Casper BYOD, not that I'm going to pitch Casper because I work at Jamf, but um, in our BYOD product, we try to be very clear about what we're going to do on a device. Um, that way, when people bring their own devices into the office and enroll them, they, they have a reasonable assurance that we're not going to screw them over. Um, but profiles are dynamic. So I might manage preferences. Things are running real time, some things. Um, and, and you can make changes. Um, who's used profiles to push things out like through the command line and scripting the command line through a tool like Monkey or something like that? Um, so with MDM, the profiles become dynamic. You know, we're making these changes on the fly as we go. Um, but what happened to once, always, and often? Does anyone miss that? Um, of the people up there who were uh, still using MCX or using MCX because of this specifically? Well, we're still using it because there's certain functionality which uh, is available in profiles, but you, with MCX you can configure any managed profile. Right. So, so you're after the com you're after the com dot Microsoft dot whatever. Yeah. Um, Does anyone remember this tool? Um, so show of hands, who has switched from using Package Maker to Composer? And who's using uh, Packages? The tool called Packages, not the technology. Um, so of the people who didn't raise their hand, just feel free to yell out, what are you using? Or are you not packaging? You don't count. <laughs> You're wearing a SpongeBob shirt. You don't count. <laughs> um, so who's distributing uh, or signing their own packages? Um, who's trying to distribute unsigned packages? How long will packages last? Does anyone have an idea? Any so everything's in the App Store. So that, that was my answer um, when I wrote this slide. Uh, so in iOS, you can deploy custom apps without them being in the Mac App Store or the iOS App Store, correct? Um, and most apps are, uh, Apple's goal with apps is now for them to become self-contained .app bundles, just like an IPA is pretty much a self-contained app bundle, right? So. Um, if I were to try to read the tea leaves, which I really don't like to do, but I feel like in a keynote I'm supposed to do in some way, shape, or form, I would argue that someday um, the way we distribute apps will be as .app bundles and not as application packages. Um, Tony agrees with me. Two years. <laughs> Two years. All right. 
Anyone think more or less? Going once, going twice, sold to Tony for two years. I think you're probably pretty close. Um, so VPP also, or uh, MDM also brings us depth. Um, has anyone gotten, I think it's been here for a couple months now, has anyone gotten a chance to toy with depth-based devices? Um, I, I, I squealed like a schoolgirl the first time, I, actually I didn't, but it, um, the first time I got to fire up a depth device and turned it on and it's just enrolled in MDM and it installed all my Mac Store apps and it was, it was a beautiful thing. Um, uh, I feel the same way about iOS devices as I do about Macs. Um, you know, with Macs, it, it introduces a very interesting question, which is, you know, we can always log in, we can always elevate our privileges, we can always remove the depth profile from a Mac. You can't do that with an iOS. With a depth-based device, um, when you when you set, when it enrolls, it's stuck in depth in uh, your MDM and it can't leave. With a Mac, you can you can still boot to recovery mode. You can do whatever you want. You can you can get that out of depth. So. It fixes some of the issues that we've seen in larger environments, especially for automating the setup of devices, but it doesn't fix all of the issues. So who thinks imaging is dead? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, who's imaged iPads? It's not really called imaging, right? It's called restoring. So, um, you know, you take an IPSW, you drop it on a device, it explodes into a full-blown OS, right? Um, Apple configurator. Um, so who's watched the, uh, the WWDC session on SIP? Um, who, knows, who does not know what SIP is yet? All right, um, so in 10.11, you will no longer be able to write into slash system um, you'll no longer be able to write into a couple other protected directories. Um, some of the technologies that some of the apps use uh, that are out there, like uh, Hopper, anyone used Hopper to disassemble binaries? Um, you know, the, some of these tools use things like method swizzling, um, and any protected app, Apple binary is gonna be protected against those kind of intrusions into their memory space. So. Basically, Apple's saying, and they're, they're drawing a line in the sand, and they're saying, we don't want you to screw up these operating systems anymore, the same way that iOS has done. Um, I, have a, I have a good example of why this might be important. Um, I was working on a, on a box maybe four years ago, um, and it was one of those scenarios where there was this crazy emergency, and I had to get on an airplane and fly to some god-awful place that I don't even want to remember where it was um, at the very last minute. huh? <laughs> I like Melbourne. <laughs> the coffee was dodgy, but um, <laughs> I say that for these guys. Um, so, so um, you know, the the TCP/IP stack um, in a in a Mac had gotten um, subverted, and the the machine had been turned into a uh, a, a zombie of sorts, um, and it was a, a kind of unique situation and. And, uh, you know, as effectively, the TCP stack is uh, comprised of a bunch of drivers that are sitting in system, and that wouldn't have been able to happen if, the, if that space was protected. Um, it was a drive-by, so it wasn't like the user actually clicked on something they weren't supposed to. Um, we filed it with Apple and ended up being listed in, in an XProtect manifest later. Um, the, you know, these kind of security incidents, they kind of happen. Um, and I find that, you know, what Apple's been doing, um, has anyone seen a, a real virus on a Mac? Uh, it's, it's extremely rare. And one of the reasons it's rare is because Apple keeps protecting us and they keep making some smart decisions on our behalf. Some, sometimes we don't agree with the decisions, but, um, but they, they keep us secure. And so it's kind of hard to argue uh, from that perspective that, that they're not doing the right thing. Um, you know, SIP helps to, to maintain that security. As OS X integrations become larger, they help to, uh, to keep us better protected than Windows devices. So. Um, so SIP is not active during recovery mode. So you can still boot a machine into recovery mode and restore an operating system. Um, and that's why, basically, imaging isn't dead. But it is going to be different. Um, DEP, for example, um, other things, you know, maybe we'll only be able to restore in much the same way that an iOS 
devices, we restore uh, system settings. Um, so thin imaging, no imaging, um, and by no imaging, it seems odd to say imaging's not dead when I'm talking about no imaging, but with thin, thin imaging, I, I could see that maintaining. Um, it, but I, I see it in the future moving much towards like what we do in Apple Configurator. Um, and I don't know what kind of year, number of years I'd put around that, but you know, um, I, I do see that as the future. So maybe it'll be more like installing an IPSW on an iOS device. Um, restore user land settings, um, much the same way you might do in iTunes today, if you want to get like the background and the place where you put the icons and stuff like that. The place that you put the icons. Um, now on an iOS device, the place that you put the icons is, you know, this screen or that screen, and what, what is the iOS device missing that OS X has for navigating things? That's just an interesting concept, throwing that out there. Um, so OS X is becoming simpler, yet again. Um, OS X, you know, self-contained app bundles, whereas once upon a time that wasn't something that we were going to see um, now. Um, who thinks that they have apps out there that are too complicated to be moved into a self-contained app bundle? Um, I, I've heard at least 20 vendors say this. Um, people with kext files that they need to unload and load, um, things of that nature. Um, I have two words, one word and an abbreviation, um, to answer that, which is server app. Um, OS X server used to be an operating system. It used to um, ship on devices, and now it's an app. Um, now, you could argue, well, it's Apple stuff, so they can leave binaries wherever they want in the OS, and, and then they, their app can access them and stuff like that. But the OS X server team, in simplifying the OS, managed to get all of OS X server into a self-contained app bundle. So my response to any vendor who has basically said, our stuff's too complicated to get into an app bundle, is OS X server. <clears throat> Who thinks that uh, the Mac App Store is simpler than deploying packages? Um, who has spent countless hours um, working on pre-flight scripts, post-flight scripts? Where do you drop the files? Do you, uh, do you launch CTL? Uh, do, you, do you fire up something, stop it? When do you do that? Um, in, in a package, there's four places you can put a script. Um, there's positional parameters. Uh, you know, you can bring variables in, send variables out. Um, with a self-contained .app bundle, you can't do any of that. You don't need to do any of that. <clears throat> um, who loves PLUtil or PListBuddy? Um, profiles are simpler than managing these property lists. Um, binding. Who's got a bind script that's over 500 lines? Um, you know, I, I've got one that I, that I wrote in just the sanity checking before the script ran. Because really, bind is like two commands, right? Um, but all the sanity checking is the DNS right, um, do I have an IP address, you know, waiting, and things like that. Some of these scripts just get longer and longer and longer with each OS revision. Um, so binding to... Uh, to a directory service kind of sucks. Um, enrollment is pretty simple. Um, restoring an iOS device, it's got a lot more manual labor, but it's simpler than imaging, right? An identity management, um, who uses an identity management service? Um, just out of curiosity, if you don't mind yelling out what you use. Sorry. Dang, that's a, that's a brave one. <laughs> Interesting. Um, does, does anyone use something like uh, 1Password or, or um, how about uh, Okta? Um, federated SAML-based security? Thank you for the research. <laughs> um, if I ask if you use one of these and you say no, it might be wise to start looking into them. 
Um, so sim SIP is simpler than having the sanity check every kext. Not for us, it's simpler for Apple. So, um, so kexts, um, who's got third-party kexts running on their machines? Um, signed packages is simpler for Apple than unsigned packages. And actually, it's now simpler for us. If the OS vendor signs it, we don't have to re-sign it as part of our packaging process. Um, Apple's business. Fewer models is simpler to keep track of and sell than more models. I'd actually argue they have more models of things right now than they've pretty much ever had if you include iOS devices and Apple Watches, and God, there's a lot of SKUs for watch bands. Um, you know, when I got my watch, the first thing someone said is, oh, you're a white band kind of guy. I'm like, I'm like, I didn't know that the color of the band that I got said anything about me. The reason I got a watch with a white band was because someone told me um, that they would ship immediately as opposed to waiting for the black band. So I ordered the black band as well, and it shipped two months later. <laughs> like, I just wanted my darn watch immediately. I'm not a white band kind of guy, just saying. Um, so, so again, we saw Apple's, the number of, Apple, of services that Apple was giving us to manage devices in mass grow until 2012, or 2010. And then Oracle bought Sun, Apple decided they weren't a big iron server company, and we saw that number start to recede. Um, and we saw Apple make insane amounts of money selling these iPads. So they made the right decision. I was an idiot for trying to talk them into the wrong decision. And who listens to me anyways, right? Um, but, you know, who, has, who feels like they have enough Apple admins in their organization? Um, who feels like the explosion of Apple devices that need managing, actually, there's enough Apple admins to go around? Who's seen um, much better job opportunities over the last few years? Um, those of us who have been in the community for a long time, we, in a lot of ways, can write our own checks, and it's only growing, right? So in order for the new people to come in so that we can do cooler stuff, we need to remove the barriers and make it simpler for people to use Apple technology and admin the stuff in mass. And, um, and we need to be nice to them when they get here because they're not going to know much, especially if they're coming from the Windows platform because having taken a whole lot of MCSE exams, terms like LDAP never showed up. Kerberos, um, I, I think I've taken 25 Microsoft exams and not one has ever had a question that had Kerberos or LDAP in it. So we had to understand a lot of these technologies at a baser level than a lot of other people did. Um, so removing the barriers for us, um, you know, Apple's just trying to make things simpler, easier to use. But it's important to use some of these systems in the way that they're designed to be used. Um, so I, so I, I've spent a lot of time making things happen on computers that weren't supposed to happen. Um, and sometimes that's R&D, sometimes that's just a customer who's just, I wanna do this. Um, but the, the writing is on the wall for how Apple wants us to use a lot of this stuff. And there are going to be sessions over the next two days on packaging. And over the next two or three years, we have to know that. And so we have to attend those sessions, and we have to keep those skills where they are. But maybe if we're doing Mac App Store you know, um, apps, maybe if we're doing things looking for ways not to break how Apple wants us to actually be using this technology. Um, and you can make an argument, well, they really want us to be using Mac App Store stuff because they make more money off of it. But that's kind of okay because it's, it's easier, and so we should be able to do it faster, and that should, in the long term, save us a little bit of money. And this is my last slide. We have 14 minutes. Um, and so I kind of thought I'd open it up to you guys and say, um, how do you think Apple's going to make this stuff simpler moving forward? Do you think I'm full of it? Do you think that, you know, what do you think? I'll start with Duncan. Because <laughs> I know your name and you're right in front of me. Um, they'll just continue to take things away. Things Look. will disappear that they think we no longer need to use. 
So I mentioned a few things. Do you want to reiterate any of those things or add anything? Where my brain's at too. Um, you know, the, the packaging thing, I, I do that at the moment all the time, but I know it's finite. I've been saying it's finite for about four years now, and it's lasted longer than I thought it would. Um, how about you? Any, any thoughts? Um, I think it's interesting that the hypervisor.framework thing is introduced actually currently is now in. So that's an extremely interesting topic, hypervisor framework. So, um, so what do you need? You need to load a lot of things that are in weird places if you're a company like VMware um, and, and you're trying to get Fusion running, or if you're Parallels. Um, who still has a lot of VMs running around to do task-based things on their Macs and their large deployments? App, you know, applicants screw over the virtualization providers. Um, because we need them for large deployments. Um, there's an accountant, the person who writes the check for all this Apple stuff. Apple likes those checks. They want to get those checks, and regrettably, that person is probably using um, some kind of Windows software to, to help them get those POs processed. Um, so in order to facilitate um, not screwing over those providers, what we see is hypervisor framework. Um, so maybe in the future, all those uh, tools like Fusion are going to do is hook into that. Um, it also provides a lot of really good um, opportunities for third parties to kind of build a prettier GUI around it in a way. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's an, a very interesting perspective. And if you think about it, when did hypervisor framework show up? It showed up like a year ago, right? So. Um, so that means that Apple was preparing for SIP, and, or rootless, or whatever you want to call it, a year ago. Um, so, so none of these are rash decisions. You know? um, the product management team there is very smart, and they, they kind of think ahead much better than me, pro you know, for sure. So any other? <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, so it's according to, to where, integrating how, integrating what. Um, none of them are fully mature on the Mac platform. They're all much more mature on the Windows platform. Um, I like uh, one, was it one login, um, and I like Okta a lot. Um, we use Okta. Um, I used it before I came to Jamf as well. Um, there, there are you know, a, few, a few like that. Centrify has... Um, Probably one of the more mature ones for the Apple platform. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know if you have a requirement to have your own servers uh, or to use a third party. Um, you know, SA the move for a lot of these things is SaaS, and so Okta and and one login for that. I would say, um, if you do have a requirement for your own server, I would say looking at Centrify or something like that. Um, Sun. Um, I've found that to be the most complicated. You kind of need someone on staff for that, as opposed to Centrify, which could be 10% of a Mac admin's job. You know, um, just different perspectives. Okta is 1% of a Mac admin's job. So, um, you know, it's just how you prefer to go about it. Um, does anyone know what SAML is, or not know what SAML is? Um, just in case you're afraid of raising your hand, um, which I usually am. Uh, SAML is uh, federated security to, to it's kind of like Kerberos for the web. That's probably the easiest way to put it. Um, and that's kind of, I remember someone telling me like five years ago that SAML was the, the wave of the future, and I was like, whatever, dude. But, um, but I, I think as people are getting to scenarios where they're trying not to bind machines, whether Windows or Mac environments, that kind of becomes necessary. And uh, Okta has apps for iOS, so I, I don't use them personally, but, um, but they have them. So. And it works pretty well with Safari. I think I've only seen one or two apps that, that don't work with their Safari plugin. Um, so, go ahead. Do you have any opinions about, from a hypervisor for um, a lot of Mac admins talking about containerization? Docker. Docker. Yeah. 
idea about if you have a feeling about maybe where Apple might sit with that or, or moving forward as far as administration? I think that Apple is happy to let people use Docker. I think they have no vision of what they're going to do with anything like that. Um, With Hyper-V? Well, to host, to host it natively within Windows, yeah. that involves the whole recall. Yeah. I don't feel that Apple has any um, objectives to that kind of thing. I, I feel like they begrudgingly allow virtualization on their operating system, um, and that silently maybe they're laughing at the people who are doing it because um, they see it as, as 1990s era technology. Um, you know, having said that, in big iron environments, obviously it's a must. Um, if you're if you're doing uh, whether Casper or Monkey deployments, um, help, heck, even FileWave, um, you might end up Dockerizing, you know, um, your deployments, and it, it greatly simplifies things for us admins. But um, but I don't think Apple has any care in the world about it, as far as putting it on server, etc. They're much more concerned with making sure that you can check in Xcode. Um, so that you can build more iOS apps, so that the App Store gets even bigger, and those mounds of those big piles of gold bricks that they get to carry around get bigger. And I don't have gold bricks in my house, so I can't say that there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Um, I fully support all of their decisions as long as they share some of those gold bricks with me. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, just a little observation. So, I take a comment on. Um, so Apple has never made a secret of being a primarily consumer products company. Um, I would say prosumer as well, but yeah, well, true. So, and the IT administration slash enterprise administration side of things has always been sort of a uh, team of paramedics bottom of the cliff, surgically welding interesting services and tools on top of what's actually generating the lion's share of the revenue. Like a beautiful Rube Goldberg machine. Oh, yes. My experience is in. Apple administrator has been over the you know, 10 years or so dealing with a number of extraordinarily complicated solutions to reasonably simple problems and then having, once you've mastered it, having the rug yanked out from underneath you is apparent on changes. Yep. From operating, operating <coughs> I'm sure we've all had that experience. Um, I'm not picking up on just a few times. <laughs> um, so, one of the really attractive things about Casper as a solution for me is that by using those enterprise tools provided by Casper, I've insulated myself from a lot of that risk. Yep. My, my institution has now um, proxied that responsibility for dealing with those changes off to Casper. And, and um, any changes to that environment <coughs> in OS X and, and iOS, um, all of those are now damage problems. Yep. From my and we are we love to take those problems, as does FileWave, you know, whoever, because we get paid for that. Do you see that trend continue? I mean, am I going Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> yep. I mean, obviously, we can't do it for the next year or two, right? Because or three or however long it takes. So we have to keep up to date on those on those skills today. But in the future, yeah, it's all about the third party products. For the most part, uh, platforms like AirWatch and, and Casper are in a position to provide that service. Are they more okay with secret roadmaps? So, so what we see, yes. <laughs> um, so one one thing that we see with um, with the third parties is we're incentivized to to build things, and you see many miniature conferences sprouting up across the globe. There's more conferences today than ever. Um, Airbnb, has anyone used that? Um, so Airbnb had a conference a few weeks ago. Um, Jamf, we have a conference. Airwatch has a conference. FileWave threw a conference this year for their first time. Um, pretty much every vendor now, in part of their marketing plan and marketing budget, throws conferences. Um, and so we're, we're seeing fragmented conference space. We're seeing Apple not doing it. Um, we're seeing Microsoft doing it more for partners and et cetera. But, um, but that's one example. Um, we have training that we provide, as, as do all of the, the providers. I don't want to be a 
a Jamf person up here, but I am. Um, you know, the, the vendors have all of, all of these things that Apple used to do. Um, did anyone ever take the advanced systems administration class that Apple, Apple built? That was a good class, I thought. Um, I mean, they, I learned a bunch of things in that, and that doesn't happen for me in classes a lot. Um, you know, now if you want advanced systems administration, you need to go to a third party, um, and, and pretty much you need to take an advanced systems administration class on their product, you know? Um, and we're, we're gonna change things here and there, but we're not gonna change things nearly at the pace that Apple's going. And, but we are gonna have to, um, to maintain the same pace as them. I think one of Champ's big value adds that Chip mentions in every keynote is that, that we're zero day with new releases. So, uh, you know, 10, 11 drops, um, we'll probably have full support for it that day. 10, 10 dropped, we had full support for it that day, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're, you know, and OS 10 server never had full support for OS 10 on day one. I mean, software update server, many versions of the release wasn't compatible with, with what was coming. So, um, you know, but we're incentivized to do that in ways that they weren't. For them, it was a cost center. For us, it's a profit center. So. packages before and conceivable change where packages goes away. While you were talking about that, initially I was thinking, oh, I never thought of that. But then I realized, well, actually, do I care? Some yep. Yeah. And I mean, we're building patch management. Um, you know, Auto Package does some of this work for you. And, you know, um, the, the future of those kind of products, like, oh, let me go spend a whole boatload of time cobbling together all these open source technologies. Um, you know, or I could just buy a third party product um, who's going to train me and they'll keep up with the package with, with all the different technologies and all I have to know is their interface. You know, that becomes, I mean, Windows admins have been dealing with it for, for decades, um, you know, Altiris, et cetera. Um, it, you know, they happen to sell SCCM, but it's still pretty much the, the same interface for SCCM version over version as opposed to having to learn Windows 10 versus Windows 9 internals. So, yeah. One minute, by the way. Last question. We have scenarios where third-party vendors have embraced the changes with Apple, and you may have, for want of a better word, a fourth-party vendor, whether it's a software developer yeah. that um, we all know their names, who just will not standardize the way they do things. Um, do you think that, do you see patterns with them <coughs> getting with the program, or do you think we're still going to face these edge cases where we can't Deploy. Apple's not going to. Apple's made it clear they're not going to allow the edge cases to continue. Yeah. I mean, I would say SIP is a line in the sand. They have drawn it, and they're saying get with the program or get out of our ecosystem. SIP breaks nothing. That we, if we're doing things the right way, if you're doing things the right way, it should all be fine. Um, Casper, we weren't doing the right things the right way, um, so we had to move our binaries, and you know we're doing a bunch of work to get to get with the program, and we'll have it out before it becomes an issue. You know, and every vendor will have to do that. So, last question, 10 seconds. And um, yes, we are aware that as how BYOD or premium open devices has become popular. Mm -hmm. So is the uh, uh, Windows based as the the virtual desktop or the uh, Dell and the the V workspace. And so that's the, the uh, user and user of premium open devices has just not been as how all the desktop virtual desktop appear. Does Apple? Is going to do something like that, or do you, do you have any idea so they are going to do similar way as a virtual desktop or virtual OS for customers? Uh, I don't see it. Um, so the question is, will we have something like VMware View for OS X, basically? Um, I, you know, if if a third party wants to hook into the hyper hypervisor framework in OS X and build it, then Apple won't complain about it. But I, I don't see the value of of them building it themselves. So um, they had it. They had it a long time ago. It was called Netboot, and it was awesome in a way. Um, and, and you know, I mean, it was a different way to approach that same concept. But, but um, and we still have Netboot, but it's now a utility for imaging as opposed to, you know, something that people run full time. So anyways, that's the last question. Um, I don't want to grew up the schedule. So thank you all so much for the questions and thanks for having me and I look forward to doing one more uh, presentation before we're all done.
So thanks, Charles. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.